another week, another show of Hawkeye with me, Dave O'Hara. Pleased to be joining you. Thanks for tuning in. Got another great show lined up for you this week. I know you'll think so after viewing it. James Morris is going to join us this week. We're going to talk some Hawkeye defense. And uh, James Vandenberg out this week, so his former teammate James Morris, the linebacker from Solon, Iowa, former Iowa Hawkeye, former NFL player, now working with Green State Credit Union, formerly a principal financial. So we got a lot to catch up on with James Morris, who, as you remember, when we had him on last month, James and his wife have a new baby. So we're going to talk to James as well about how he's adjusting to his new life. So that being said, we'll have David Eichholt following up James Morris, our Hawkeye Insider. And now we're going to go and give our first segment to Craig and Stacy Schrader uh, with Fight with Flash Foundation via Facebook or fightwithflash.org. So, Craig, I'll start with you this week, and then Stacy will close out with you. Unfortunately, we talked about Dick Vitale, the famous ESPN uh, basketball broadcaster and legend uh, in media. And we talked last week about how he was uh, hit with cancer again for a second time and how instrumental he's been in helping you and Stacy getting Fight with Flash off the ground. He still talks about Austin Flash Schrader during Hawkeye broadcast. Uh, you know, Fran and Margaret McCaffrey introduced you into that world, and we're going to have the McCaffreys on at some point upcoming this season. But, you know, I asked you and Stacy off camera, and I'll bring it on camera. It's unfortunate, or why does it take someone famous to get this before people start saying, oh my goodness, this really happens. You know, my mom had cancer. Unfortunately, your son passed away because of cancer. And like you said, Stacy and Craig both, people don't realize until it hits them, hey, this could really happen. So Craig, if you would, we always talk about awareness. And obviously we want to raise financial support and you offer, you and Stacy offer emotional support to parents and families going through this. But let's get back to awareness and why this has to happen for people to take note. You know, it's, it's, it is amazing because everybody just goes on their regular part of their life. And a lot of times it's kids, a lot of times it's work. Um, there's so many, obviously, distractions that go on. And, and, you know, we all want to plan everything out, right? And so when something, when something difficult, adversity hits us, and it, it doesn't matter if it's cancer or something else, you know, and an injury, an illness of something um, or of a family member, it causes us to stop and pause. And, uh, um, I will just say that uh, that most people have little bumps in the road and they quickly get back on with their normal life. Um, but when it comes to something like this, and especially when it comes to somebody like you know Dick Vitale that is so well known, and then people will really, really stop and question, well, why him? And uh, and, and, and obviously everybody is, is praying for Dick and uh, um, he is amazing. You know, we had uh, texted him last week while we were, um, you know, in Colorado. And, uh, you know, we knew exactly he's going to be fighting this how he is fighting this. He's going to be open. Mm -hmm. He is going to be honest. He is still going to be doing his like daily motivations for people. He's asking people for two things. And he is asking, number one, he wants prayers. Um, he's going through this and he wants prayers for himself and his family, but also what he's asking for is, is if anybody else can donate to his mission and donate to the V Foundation and he wants it to go to pediatric cancer and he does not want it to go to his age group or anything else, no money. He just wants to be able to continue his drive and his passion to make a difference in the pediatric cancer fight. So. Well stated, Craig, and he has been all over social media and media and publicizing this. And as the three of us agreed last week and the week before, cancer picked the wrong dude to mess with. Because he is, yeah, like you said, he's out front with it. And that's, that's fantastic for such a horrible thing. Thank you for that, Craig. And Stacy. so let's talk about some upcoming things. Let's bring it back local again with Fight With Flash. What do we got happening? Much yeah. going on as always. Um, well, we're going to do a, um, a push day, basically a push month, um, November 22nd through December 22nd. Uh, it's going to, it's a fund the need. And what it is, we want to try to push it out there to people to uh, raise some funds for their Fight With Flash Foundation so we can give cash and gift cards to the children and families at the hospital Great. who will have to be there over That's the holidays. So. Fantastic. And was and there then, something else? I thought you had one then, other thing. Yes, yeah. we have one other thing. Um, in December, December 10th, we will be do, holding our Fight With Flash garage sale that we do every year and get rid of all the remaining stuff in the, um, or just our little leftovers, right. um, which are wonderful. And um, yeah, so we have that and that's such a big, so so many people can get their last minute Christmas gifts, things like that. So we've got wonderful stuff, sweatshirts, t-shirts, long sleeves, short sleeves, jewelry. We've Your got jewelry, <laughs> his zip up. I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times and I'll continue to say it hundreds hats. more. Yeah. Go to yeah. Fight With Flash Foundation via Facebook or again, Fight With Flash. 
www.dayboharrisports.org, dayboharrisports.com. We have all the links there for you. Again, please stay tuned after the show. Go over to dayboharrisports.com and watch the complete and full-length web-exclusive video with Craig and Stacey Schrader and me and Fight with Flash Foundation. So, Craig, Stacey, we'll talk to you on the website side, and thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dave. Dave. Truly my pleasure. You're welcome, and thank you. So, for Craig and Stacey Schrader, we'll be back in one moment with James Morris, former Hawkeye linebacker. Back with more Hawkeye with me, Dave O'Hara, in just a few moments. In farming, everybody knows relationships drive the industry. And with Mershman Seeds, you've got a friend in the field. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. We're the friend that delivers with extraordinary speed. We're the friend that shares knowledge and innovation. We're the friend that cares about your yields and profits. And we just happen to have the most advanced seed technology in the industry. When you choose the best seed, you also get the best people. Mershman Seeds, your friend in the field. Hi, I'm Joel from Tice Chevrolet. We've lived through some very interesting times the last few months. Ensuring everyone's safety is more important than ever. That is why we're participating in the Chevy Clean program. At your request, we will pick up your vehicle, service it, and return it after we've cleaned it using the current CDC guidelines. This is just another way to work towards exceeding your expectations. So give us a call and let us show you what it means to be part of the Tice Automotive family. Welcome back to Hawkeye with me, Dave O'Hara. As you can see on the screen, my buddy James Morris, former Iowa Hawkeye linebacker. But most importantly, James, we're going to lead into former Solon linebacker. There's some news coming out of Solon with your dad and a, fire, a new firehouse. I'm going to get out of the way and let you get a shout out for dad, please. Yes, my shameless plug. My dad's <laughs> been uh, raising money to help uh, build the new firehouse for the Solon Fire District. So to all your viewers, uh, take a minute, go look them up on Twitter. And uh, if you want to participate or chip in, it would be uh, more than welcome and appreciated by uh, the hardworking folks in Solon and certainly my dad. So not just doing work for your family, but also the fine community of Solon. So that out of the way, James, we got to get to this. Uh, again, congratulations on your transfer or moving from principal to financial to now working with Green State Credit Union. And you said Green State, things are going very well there, correct? Yeah, it's great. Um, Eastern Iowa-based organization, um, loving every minute of it so far, and uh, it's been a good deal. And by the way, Evelyn is now, uh, she's, is she six weeks old or how old is she? Yes, yes. My daughter is now six weeks Oof. old, so moving into the next set of outfits. Well, James, don't wonder uh, when you open your eyes next time, she'll be 16. I don't want to live all those years out that quick, but it, sometimes it seems like it goes that fast. Take it from personal experience. So, Let's get to the Hawkeyes. I've tried to delay it as much as I could, but there's just no way around it as you're rubbing your hands together. Let's get to game analysis here. Let's start with the Purdue game first. And I really appreciated your off-camera analysis on this, and I want you to get to this on-camera. And you talked about when I said to you, David Bell, why wasn't he double-covered? Or we heard all this. Jeff Brom, former Purdue, or Purdue coach, said after the Wisconsin game, well, Wisconsin double-teamed uh, David Bell and Iowa didn't. And we heard a lot of other broadcasters say, well, they should be doubling David Bell. And he heard all the fans outcry. Give us your explanation as to they kind of did double David Bell. Yeah, that was kind of what I was seeing. I wasn't obviously in the meeting rooms and I don't know what the play calls were, but Iowa doesn't play a ton of man relative to some of the other teams in the league. So when they try to double people, it's almost like an indirect double where the the corner will end up being on David Bell man to man. So I use Matt Hankins name as an example, and then they'll have a, a half safety that will sit over the top. And so what's supposed to happen is when David Bell runs vertical, Matt would, they call it running in phase. Matt would get in phase with David and kind of play inside and underneath. And then the safety would have him over top. And so they work into a double team when he runs deep. On an underneath route, though, or if David were to run like a 15-yard stop, which he did about 20 times, it seemed in the game, then to the layperson, it would look like Matt Hankins um, was just playing a one-on-one. -on -one. So they, they have double teams for deep stuff, but in terms of like underneath stuff, it would just look like traditional coverage, which, you know, David, he, he certainly gashed us, but I don't think he ever had any like 50 or 60-yard bombs or anything like that, you know, because it has safety over the top help. Um, but we just we're, we're playing them pretty soft most of the game. Yeah. Now let's move on to that 27-7 loss to Wisconsin. And I said to you off camera, hey, I don't want you to have to feel like you have to indict anybody. And you said, no, let's talk about Wisconsin. I'll indict some people. So what in God's green earth happened, James? 27-7 Hawkeye loss in Madtown last Saturday. 
Well, I think you got to go to protecting the ball. And anytime you're playing on the road, if, if you're giving them free possessions, um, number one, it's, it, it's free plays that, that you're not making them earn. Um, and then number two is the crowd and the momentum part of it. And you got to be able to kind of punch back when that stuff is happening. And that's something that th- this team has, has struggled with in the last couple of weeks. Um, defense was really opportunistic and really aggressive early on in the season. Um, but sometimes it's, it's hard to count on those plays. I mean, really those, those explosive defensive plays are more gravy than they are foundational. And so if you're going to say we're going to beat good teams based on our defense scoring points and creating turnovers, I don't know how repeatable a recipe for success that that is. Now, if you said, hey, we're not going to give up rushing touchdowns and we're going to keep them under 20 points, then that's a great formula. And you don't have necessarily have to create two to three turnovers a week to do it. But that only works if your offense is scoring 21 points. Yeah. Um, so there were just not not being able to do the little things. Um, and and really just giving a, a good team, not a great team, but a good team, some free plays in a hostile environment for sure. Yeah, and it just multiplies. Like you said, that snowball just gets bigger and bigger as it rolls downhill. And, and you know, you played part of that tough. Norm Parker defense in the past, now Phil Parker. And as you mentioned, uh, when it, it's an opportunistic defense like that, it's gravy and not what you base your you know, your know claim to fame on. Kirk Farron said today in his press conference or in his press availability that the offense has become very predictable. So since James Vandenberg isn't here this week and you're sitting in for James, uh, to say that his offense has become very predictable, I think, would be an understatement. Would that be something you'd say about Phil Parker's defense too, or as you just said, it was opportunities that just weren't there? Yeah, you know, I thought that at times the defense actually played really well against Wisconsin. They just ended up in so many scenarios where they had their back up against the wall. You know, I think about fumbles in our own territory, yep. um, the special teams, muff punt, things like that. And so when you spot teams opportunities like that or turnovers in your own minus territory, I mean, you should mentally score those as sevens. And so anytime it's not a seven, that's a win. If it's a three, that's a win. If it's a zero, that's a big win for the defense. So if you were to tell me after some of the mistakes that were made that the defense was only going to give up, let's say, 21 points, and I'd consider those unearned points, and then they give up and earned a 10 or a 15 play drive for another seven, that, that's not necessarily a bad outing, right? right? It's about understanding the context of field position and ball control. So I didn't think that the defense had their worst game. They certainly didn't have their best game, right? And if you want to beat a good team in a hostile environment, you you probably do have to create some plays, but you got to create plays on both sides of the ball, right? You can't say we're going to go out there and have 100 or 200 yards of total offense and going to beat a good team. It's just not – it's not going to happen, and you can't reasonably expect to win games doing that. And, and exactly to your point, we had Parker Hesse on this show a couple of weeks ago, a, a guy uh, you know played in the Phil Parker defense as well right around your time a little afterwards, and – we were talking about Phil's intensity, and, and to your exact point, when you get down in a hole like that, the Hawks certainly seem to lose, their defense especially. And again, we can look at the inconsistency of the defensive line, there are some injuries, there's some shuffling going back and forth, which as you know, as a former linebacker, that makes life very difficult for the linebackers, the defensive backs, multiple injuries, no excuses, just reality, multiple injuries. Everybody plays with that. You saw that when you're in your high school career at Solon, at your career at Iowa, and also your career in the NFL. So we get all that. But do you think that lack of intensity just because they were down or is Phil, uh, I don't want to say losing their edge, but it just seems they've come out flat the last couple of games on defense besides offense. No, you're 100% right. And I don't think anyone's being an armchair quarterback if they were to say, if they play, the rest of the way, like they played the last two Mm -hmm. games, they could very easily lose every game the rest of the year. I mean, I think that that's a fair statement. I think the coaches have to know that the players better know that. Um, So I I think it's warranted in this instance. Listen, I said from an energy and an execution standpoint, that was one of the worst Iowa football games I've ever seen in my life. I'm not, I'm trying not to be facetious, but it was just that bad, you know, ball control, penalties, execution, assignment, just energy. Um, it, it, It was rough, you know, so they, you know, they've won six games and they've lost two, right? Um, so you don't necessarily have to have to tear the whole stadium down and rebuild the program up from, from the ground, but you got to play better than you did the last two games, especially coming into to really crunch time. Yeah, and you know this as well as anybody, you know, losing now, they went from uh, top 10 back down to 16 now, and so 
You go into Northwestern, you know what that's like. If Pat, Pat Fitzgerald, this is their bowl game. They've not had a good year. So this is, in effect, Pat Fitzgerald, as you're nodding your head, yes. Fitzgerald and the Wildcats, they're they're coming for the Hawkeyes. You know that. And I think Fitzgerald doesn't admit this publicly, but you know he's had this circled on his calendar. Oh, for sure. Um, and I, I don't know their roster very well up and down, but I know just the way he game plans, they always match up well against us. Yep. You know, they kind of know the schemes that work well and they know what gives us problems. Um, so I would imagine that they're going to view this as a winnable game and they're going to come out and give us our best shot. Um, and it's a sleepy environment to go play in. It's, it's tough, but it's a different kind of tough, right? It's mm-hmm. kind of like uh, going back in time, like, you know, a, a high school playoff game, if you will, not quite the state championship. So you got to bring your own energy, right? And you got to come yep. out and say, we're, we're here to kick butt. Um, and go take care of business and then come back home. Uh, hopefully the guys get off the bus with that mentality. Oh, I couldn't echo what you just said any better than that. James, great stuff from you as always. He's James Morris, former Solon Iowa linebacker, former Iowa Hawkeye linebacker, former linebacker in the NFL. James, look forward to catching up with you very soon. Continued success in business and with you and your wife, with your little daughter, Evelyn, continued success and good luck. Thanks, James. Yeah, thank you, Dave. My pleasure. For James Morris, I'm Dave O'Hara. Back with more to close out the show with Hawkeye Insider David Eichel in just a few moments. Hi, I'm Joel from Tice Automotive Family. We're living through some of the most interesting and challenging times many of us have ever seen. Knowing who you can rely on is more important than ever. Many of us turn to our families to get us through. And the same holds true here. From our fair upfront pricing to exceptional service after the sale, We truly want to exceed your expectations. So give us a call or stop by and let us show you what it means to be part of the Tice Automotive family. Who do you trust to produce the best yield? A seed company that's chasing technology or a seed company that's writing a book on it? Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Mershman Seeds has been treating soybeans for decades, long before it was commonplace. We're the leader in technology, introducing Mershman Seeds' latest advancement in seed treatment with an added fungicide to help produce a faster, more even emergence every single time. Who can you trust with your yields? Mersman Seeds, your friend in the field. Welcome back to Hawkeye with me, Dave O'Hara. As you can see on the screen, my buddy David Eicholt. David, exhale. <laughs> Last two games, uh, we'll get into that a little yeah. bit, but let's cover it more as a, as a whole after sure. the loss to, uh, obviously, uh, Purdue and then uh, bye week and then Wisconsin, 27-7 Hawkeye loss. Ouch. Let's just get right to it. I'm going to get out of the way. You had press availability today with Kirk Fans and some players. Go. You know, I do think, you know, a couple things stand out to me, Dave, is number one, Keegan Johnson, freshman wide receiver, probably has future team captain written all over him. I mean, I didn't even get my chance to ask him his que- my question yet, and I'm overhearing his answer, and he said, you know, a true test of a man's character is when things get uncomfortable, and he went on to say this is where it's uncomfortable for us. we got to stay with what's been working for us as far as preparation goes and get back to those first six weeks that led them to a 6-0 record, so that stood out to me. Another thing that I think is very important to know, especially about Kirk Ferentz's uh, press avail- you know, press conference, was he said they have not considered putting in Alex Padilla over Spencer Petras, and that's something I, I agree with, mm-hmm. um, because Same I do here. think Spencer Petras is the best option right now. He said they're more focused on getting better protection up front, and I think that's where the priorities should be. And on top of that, too, another thing they talked about, what are you going to do schematically? Are you going to make any changes? And he said, you know, we're going to try different things, but the reality is, Iowa cannot overhaul their entire offensive system midseason. Right. It just it's not realistic. I know in theory it acts, you know, people think it's gonna be a good thing. It would be a disaster. It would have disaster written all over it. So I think they're really gonna evaluate that at the end of the year. And I think their entire thing right now, Dave, is move forward. I mean, they can still win ten game, ten regular season games, go to a great bowl game. I mean, you talked to people earlier in the year, if they get an eleven win season, I think everybody is signing up for that. I think the thing that, that bothers me the most, and I think a lot of the viewers and fans is, is that Iowa's destiny is no longer in their hands as far as the Big Ten yeah. championship yep. game goes. They're going to need some help from, of all people, P.J. Fleck in Minnesota to beat Wisconsin. But theoretically after that, or not even theoretically, in reality, if Minnesota can accomplish that, the Hawks do have a nice season ahead of them, yeah. regardless if they win the West or not, to your point. you know, And, and you and I have discussed this off air. And I'll bring it on the air that James Vandenberg and I have talked about this in weeks yeah. past. Now, James wasn't here this week, and we talked defense with James Morris, uh, James Vandenberg's teammate, former teammate, and uh, got a little uh, Phil Parker, what aren't they doing on D? Mm-hmm. But let's get back to you and me to get back to the offense here. And when you talk to Kirk Ferentz about that, and James Vandenberg said that, they're not going to you know wholesale changes. 
You're not going to replace the quarterback unless something dire happens. And yeah. We're not in those meetings. Sure. We're not in practices, and that's what Vandenberg said too. Hey, and who knows controversy, quarterback controversy better than James Vandenberg, and he said the same thing that day. You know, something, they're there every day, we're not. Yeah. So now let's you and I talk about the players that you talked to today and what was said. And, man, for an 18-year-old, I'll just, I don't want to bury the yeah. lead here, but Keegan Johnson, my goodness. You know, like I said, he's got future team cat written all over him. I think that was an important thing. I think Justin Jacobs, he said, you know, the linebacker Justin Jacobs said that they can utilize the lessons learned from their 0-2 start last year. And they said just because it's midseason, they can still apply that going forward. And I thought something, Dave, that really stuck out to me about Spencer Petras' interview was, you know, a lot of people have questions about Tyrone Tracy's mm -hmm. usage. He's got 89 yards on the year. I expect him to take that jump to be an honorable mention all Big Ten receiver despite how loaded the conference is. Mm. But he said, you know, he has not been discouraged in practice. He's been a great leader in the room. He's been one of the most vocal guys. He's coaching the younger guys. And he's been responsive. And I think for a guy who experienced early success in his career, yeah. to still have that attitude and that outlook with that young position room, I think that's been a good thing. And that's, I think that's something that, you know, it's it's they're going to need to get going forward because they need the wide receivers to get going. Fascinating that you say that, David, after a 6-2 and two start, Hawkeyes after eight games, 89 total yards yeah. for Tyrone Tracy Jr. If you just said 89 yards a game he was averaging, I might believe that. Sure. But So you're right. It's not what you've done now. we got to get past that, and now it's moving forward. They still have four huge games left, yep. and it's no bigger than this weekend. You and I have talked about this preseason. At Northwestern, yes, I know Northwestern's not having a great year, but Pat Fitzgerald, this is their bowl game. Let's just be blunt. Yeah. This is Northwestern's bowl game. It is, and you know Pat Fitzgerald, he'll never really say it publicly, but I think everybody who pays we attention know. to Big Ten college football knows that Pat Fitzgerald, I don't want to say it has a vendetta out for Iowa, but he he gets up about three hours early. This game is circled on his calendar, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, he yes. has it every single year. But you're exactly right. I think this is the ultimate gut check game. If Iowa cannot go into Evanston and take care of business, I'm feeling pretty nervous about the final three games. Because, yeah. look, I don't care if Nebraska is going to finish 4-8 on the year 3-9. They're still dangerous, especially if Adrian Martinez is our right. quarterback. Inland. Illinois has beaten Penn State. They can't throw the football whatsoever, and right. Art Sikowski's out for the year. They can't throw it. But Chase Brown's a good running back, and Brett Bielema's definitely going to be motivated as well. And Minnesota, do you really need to say much more besides who hates Iowa? Yeah. You know, and we want Minnesota to beat Wisconsin, but yet lay down for Iowa. So, yeah, it's not going <laughs> to – you can't have the best of all worlds. But So, David, you wrote a great piece I want to highlight in the last couple minutes here. Sure. Again, uh, HawkeyeInsider.com. David, I can't – I'm stumbling for words because you nailed so many of all the positions, what's happening, the battles going on. What a great time to look at this, yeah. the way you wrote that column. Highlight a few. You went position by position, but what stuck out on your column that stuck out the most for you? You know, I, I think, Dave, a couple of things. One, first of all, i got to give updates on this. Terry Roberts and Riley Moss are doubtful to play this week. Ivory Kelly Martin is not going to play this week. It seems like Charlie Jones is fine. Spencer Petras is all going to be a star. Remember, he left early in the yep. game due to a, a shoulder injury, but it was more so out of precaution. Look for a redshirt freshman, Gavin Williams, to take over that backup running back spot. I think that's going to be a very, very good move uh, for the staff, and I think it will be good for the running game as well. But, you know, Dave, I think the thing that stands out to me, and this is probably the least surprising thing, offensive line. Yeah. They've allowed 24 sacks this season, and I believe that leads the Big Ten right now, and it's probably among the worst in the country. And I think I need to go back and do the math on this. I think they're on pace, though, for the most sacks allowed in the Kirk Ferentz era. So, again, when you look at the line, you look at how things have developed, Dave, there are, there are plays where Tyler Linderbaum is the only one holding his block. So I don't think this goes on George Barnett. I don't think it goes on Kirk Ferentz. We asked him about it today, and he said, you know, I think it's more so youth and injuries more than anything else. Because I've told you this, I think Iowa's offensive line recruiting has been phenomenal. Yes. George Barnett knows what he's doing. I think he fits in with the culture well. It's just a matter of getting those valuable in-game reps and finding a way to speed up that development, which they do need to have. Yeah, and as we talked with James Morris about in a segment before this, you know, the defensive line consistency yep. or inconsistency, yep. which makes life horribly difficult for the linebackers and defensive backs. You mentioned the injuries in the defensive backfield. One good note, Jack Campbell is now a semifinalist for the Butkus, Dick Butkus uh, Linebacker of the Year Award. So some positive coming out of that, but it's got to get they got to get it done on the field, David, offense yeah. and defense. Yeah, no doubt. And I think, again, you know, Wisconsin only threw 42 passes over the last three games yeah. hanging into Iowa. I thought it was a great move by Paul Chris saying, hey, look, Iowa can't get a pass pressure. It can't get, you know, get pass rush on us. So we're going to throw the ball on them. And I think, you know, Graham Mertz did a great job of targeting Jamari Harris yeah. on that. 
it's worked out well for them when, you know, the scouting of seen that against Iowa worked out well for Wisconsin. But, yeah, 27-7 loss, things have got to get better. We'll talk yeah. next week and see how it goes at Northwestern, Dave. Hey, thanks, Dave. Appreciate thank you. it. You're very welcome, and thank you. He's David Eichel, HawkeyeInsider.com. I'm Dave O'Hara with Hawkeye, back with more next week. Got a lot of big guests upcoming. There's going to be a McCaffrey sighting on this show soon, so at some point we're going to have Fran, Margaret, also Connor and Patrick talking about their association with the Fight With Flash Foundation as as well. So all that being said, many big shows coming up. And thanks as always for tuning in. For David I. Colt, James Morris, Craig and Stacey Schrader, and to you, the viewers, I'm Dave O'Hara with Hawkeye. That's all for me. Thanks to all of you. As always, thanks for staying tuned in over these rolling credits at the end of the show to give our uh, advertisers and sponsors the credit and attention they so richly deserve. Without them, we don't have a program. So thanks again to them, the aforementioned guests, and to you, the viewers. I'm Dave O'Hara. That's all for me with Hawkeye. Thanks to all of you.